this interview series is to give you an opportunity to tell your story, to talk about the work that you've been doing, to share words of wisdom if you want, to just be unvarnished and be authentic in your self-expression with the hopes that people in Louisiana and outside of Louisiana will see us as a diverse cosmopolitan place of problem solvers and not problems to be solved. Right. And I always ask a series of very complex, multi-layered questions. But the first question I always start with in an interview is probably the simplest one I'll ask. And that is, where are you from? I am from uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, which is a rural-like <laughs> metropolitan area, <laughs> if that even makes sense. But um, it's, it's in the southwest area of Louisiana. And what was it like living in Lake Charles? Because I'm from Baton Rouge, and I think that I've gone through Lake Charles maybe a couple of times in my life, but I've never actually even spent the night in Lake Charles. Lake Charles, I, I compare it to Baton Rouge in so many ways. Um, I, I would say if you would picture Baton Rouge maybe like half its size, maybe, or uh, two thirds of its size, that's probably Lake Charles, greater Lake Charles area. But uh, growing up in Lake Charles, I, I was centered in a lot of communal spaces, I would say beneficial to my own development and foundation. My parents are both Christians and, and practicing Catholics, and uh, we, they uh, brought my brother up in, in the church. Uh, I first got, you know, involved with doing some type of community work and social justice driven work um, in, in my church. You know, my mom was very adamant about us having some type of involvement in the church and having some type of involvement in the community outside of school. And um, these different experiences really helped to shape and mold my character in a way and it helped me to gain some sense of uh, a worldview per se um, and being able to meet other youth across the country and across the state of Louisiana at a young age uh, was very impressionable to me. <laughs> and what did those opportunities look like for you as someone who was doing social justice work, but also doing it through the involvement of your um, church community? So, like I said, we were Catholic, but we were also like Black Catholics and Black Catholicism is a bit different. The way we do praise and worship, you might think you're in a Baptist church. <laughs> <laughs> like I even sang in the choir and everything, how we uh, celebrated our culture in African spirituality in and of itself was actually infused in my experience in growing up as a Black Catholic. I understood what the Indinkra signs were, what Sankofa meant and Jinyame. And, you know, these things are, I, I really feel naturally spiritual by nature. You know, like, I know I just said what was a redundant <laughs> phrase, but, you know, it, by nature, I feel very spiritual, and that's just, I, I would attribute that to just my upbringing, you know, and I, I give, I'm really blessed to say, think about the parents I have that were intentional about putting us in spaces that poured into us and helped us to gain our own sense of what a self-identity was, but also thinking in community and how we're actually, like, interconnected in many ways, uh, regardless of race, class, gender, orientation or whatnot, you know, um, we're all interconnected in some uh, fabulous way. And I really believe that's due to the creator of, of this earth. And I uh, actually went through like a lot of leadership development experiences with um, this group I was part of, like we had the Catholic Youth Organization, um, where I did dance liturgical really got involved with like the culture, you know, of doing praise and worship, but also getting involved with the junior daughters of the Knights of Peter Claver. The Knights of Peter Claver was a, an organization that still is practicing now where, sorry, uh, where we, um, it, it's a, it has a ladies auxiliary and the Knights of Peter Claver. So it's a women and men sector for one organization, a patron saint is uh, St. Peter Claver, of course, and he was a Dominican priest that cared for the needs of, of slaves during the uh, transatlantic slave trade in the Dominican. And, um, you know, we carry a lot of his principles and as, as him being our patron saint for the Knights of Peter Claver really formed what our mission was. And 
how we were focused on attributing to the black community in itself. And um, a main focus I remember is we always raised awareness and actually fundraise for sickle cell anemia. And that is one disease that directly impacts um, the African American community in a significant way, even in identifying <laughs> who you are genealogical wise, if you have a sickle cell trait, you're probably, you know, it's amazing how that one disease can link you to that uh, specific ethnicity. So I learned how to run meetings. I learned how to organize in a way, like my first campaign I ever ran was actually for myself. <laughs> I uh, went to uh, this uh, convention years before, like I was probably maybe like 10, 11 years old. And my mom was chaperoning with me. And I remember seeing these girls sitting behind this, you know, table. They looked so esteemed, had their little names and placards, and they had medallions on. And I was just like, wow, what is this? Like, this young girl, maybe about two years older than me at the time, is just like literally running a meeting with so much confidence in our voice. And representation matters. And to be in a room with, like, young African-American girls, young African-American boys, and just posturing themselves and in such a, a strong, astute way from various parts of the state. I'm like, I'm from Lake Charles, but I'm around people from Lafayette, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Shreveport, Monroe, and like Alexandria even. And I'm thinking like, oh wow, like all these young people, they're not only Black Catholics, but look at all their different talents. Like we had talent shows, <laughs> we had elections. And I remember that one year I decided to run for the first lay board member. And I remember telling my mom when I first seen these girls in my first convention was like, I'm going to be up there one day. And my mom was like, well, baby, go ahead and do it. <laughs> and here I was at uh, 16 and I saw the opportunity to run for a position. It was the first junior uh, first lay board member for the junior daughters of the uh, nice Peter Claver for Louisiana. So that was a statewide position. And there wasn't a girl in my uh, chapter from my area that um, ever sat on a statewide position. And I actually made history um, when I ran for this position and won. I wrote my own speech. I had my own campaign theme. I did my own, you know, design and handouts. It was like, a whole thing like my mom and dad were like my funders so my mom is at FedEx Kinko's me printing out these big old posters and brochures and business cards <laughs> with my face on them <laughs> saying vote for Maria <laughs> for this position <laughs> and uh it, it was really it was a really cool experience because that really uh shaped and molded me in, in somewhat of a way of directing me in a way of doing community work doing social justice work and and organizing and um, it's, it's, a, it's amazing to think about the people I grew up with around that time because we're still in touch with each other and we're like young adults now, like I'm 31. Many of them are 31, 32 or in their early 30s. And they're like young professionals now. Like we're, you know, went through different milestones together, but we initially met in that space, initially for the purpose of being young black Catholics, but also understanding what it means to be Black in America and actually understanding what different uh, ills impact us and what our vulnerabilities were and um, creating space and power to, you know, progress through that. So <laughs> that was a meaningful experience for me, uh, definitely growing up in Lake Charles. And then you went from Lake Charles to Baton Rouge, where you went to Southern. Yes. And <laughs> how was that being at Southern, being at an HBCU, what did you study and what did organizing look like for you at a public, secular, more, more or less university compared to most of the time kind of being launched into your community organizing through being a Black Catholic? And being a Black Catholic in itself actually politicized me too. My experience in high school uh, shaped and molded my view of, of racial relations, I guess you can say, and what my own experiences were. So that in itself is what motivated me to choose an HBCU to go to. And uh, my HBCU of choice was uh, Southern University, which is why I came to Baton Rouge. And I, I graduated in 2006. So my experience, my senior year of high school experience was a bit different because I'm also going in knowing different young people I already knew coming up, you know, with the organization I was part of. But also knew a lot of young people from New Orleans that I uh, probably crossed paths with going to school or 
um, just meeting and, and building a special relationship about being impacted by a hurricane during your senior year in high school, you know, because uh, Hurricane Katrina happened in fall of 2005. And uh, we went through Hurricane Rita in fall of 2005 as well around the Lake Charles area, Texas area. So I had a, I had some inkling of, of empathy to know how I felt to actually uproot and leave um, in the middle of senior year. And then, but we were able to come back, you know, we were able to recover a bit better than, of course, New Orleans was able to. And I actually seen how uh, each of my friends I built relationships with from New Orleans went through their own experience at Southern. But one thing I appreciated about Southern was how they centered Black culture and our Blackness. It was just something that came natural. Um, it was something to meet other young people who were Black that came to an HBCU with the same purpose that I did, you know, just having some uh, different experiences from being in a multicultural or a white dominant multicultural uh, institution, <laughs> per se, that uh, really you've seen that bias. You've seen how you didn't feel relevant in a, in a general space, per se, um, that didn't really feel multicultural, but, but just more so white dominant with a few uh, different ethnicities sprinkled in but the dynamics and how you were treated and how you were seen, um, your work that you put forth in your schoolwork, you know, was it credible or not, you know, um, how the, the teachers and staff treated you, how were you reviewed, you know, overall, you, you know, we, we knew that we didn't want to carry those same experiences into uh, another space similar to that dynamic. We wanted to be in a black space, you know, and, um, I appreciated Southern University for that. It also uh, exposed me to different ways of adultism, <laughs> like learning how to adult in that space, but it was still somewhat sheltered. I, experienced, I, I appreciate that experience. And I studied political science. I already had a natural knack for politics. I guess that's what geared me to do what I did when I was in high school, but, <laughs> you know, um, I knew going to an HBCU and knowing what I was going to study, I did not want to go to a predominantly white institution. Like that was just not going to work. <laughs> I needed to be in an environment that would pour into me and pour into my strengths. And it didn't feel like I was going to have to deal with a challenge almost every day to just debate a simple point of existence. So I appreciated Southern for that because I met some very dynamic and powerful professors uh, that were very relevant. I seen myself in them. They seen themselves in me in a way where um, that special sense of connectedness is very rare and, and it's special. And I feel like any person that's in a learning environment, they need some sense of connectedness with their teacher. You're learning, you're expanding your thought process. You're, you're coming in different than you were before, you know, so um, well, coming out different than you were before. So that's the whole purpose of learning something and growing. And I appreciated my experience. And then that really shifted um, how I organized as well, because I saw different opportunities from being in Baton Rouge. Um, the Louisiana Democratic Party is located out here, uh, the state capitol. So I just took advantage uh, during that time. A lot of people kept saying, take internships. So though you're not getting paid, you want the experience, you want to network. And, and that's essentially what I did. I, uh, I got involved with the Louisiana Democratic Party as an intern in like 2008, 2009. And uh, I got involved doing local election work with like local judges. And I really got to understand what it meant to, you know, just put yourself out there in a way of uh, getting people to, to go your way. And it's almost like you're selling a product, even though you're... <laughs> you're pushing the idea of people to trust this individual to, to run and, and, and get their vote and, and, and be elected in office. And um, it was great to be around some wholesome people like uh, Judge John Guidry. He, he was a, a great leader and um, gave us a great experience with, um, at the time I was thinking about going to law school. So I was president of the Pre-Law Society and part of the Political Science Association. So. I remember going on these different trips with being introduced to different law school admission council people that were in various universities, law schools across the country, and then also helped to form my leadership in some way with 
organizing a trip, you know, that's always a lot of work to do. <laughs> but um, that pretty much geared me for like future opportunities that came along the way. Um, I remember being in grad school and I decided to go to grad school because law school didn't work out. I actually changed my mind, which pretty much put me in a different direction as far as a uh, career is concerned. Cause I was thinking, okay, I'm going to just go and be an attorney. I'm gonna go to law school, pass the bar whatnot. But that totally shifted after I graduated with my bachelor's in political science, because I couldn't get in. I didn't have a high enough score. That was like a constant challenge for me. But then some, some of my friends said, well, why don't you go into getting a master's in public administration? You can do nonprofit work, community organizing. You're already doing that. I'm like, okay, let's see what this is about. And that actually opened a lot of doors for me. Like I actually seen like, hey, you can still work with attorneys. They can actually help carry out cases for you if you want to seek justice. <laughs> You know, so I, I seen the point of how community organizing and the law go hand in hand. It was pretty cool. Um, and I learned that going to grad school and getting my master's. And I met some amazing people along the way, like a big shout out to Dr. Leslie Grover. She was very impressionable on me when I got in grad school. I met her uh, in my first class with her it was like a writing seminar class. And she just really helped me to... Uh, professionalize my writing, you know, and really thinking of uh, on a real scholarly level, I guess you can say of like on a level of actually publishing work and whatnot. And um, I really pride in myself in that, especially with public policy, because I just have a natural interest in um, understanding how the law works and how systems of governance works amongst a society of people, because I really believe in liberation. I really believe in um, equity and equality in, in meaningful ways and uh, in, in really thinking of how we can reach people in an equitable manner on different levels where we all feel like it's an even playing field, you know. And um, I pay attention to how laws are framed because words are powerful <laughs> and um, I've always believed that but I just felt it's really important to understand the law and like how we craft our ideologies. It's just so important. So getting that, that foundation on a graduate school level was very meaningful. I didn't go to an HBCU for my educational career. I went to the University of New Orleans and I went to the school called the School of International Training Grad Institute. And both of them were PWIs but they were very non-traditional. UNO was like very, very diverse people yeah. from all over the world. SIT was a school oriented towards international affairs, development work. So I met people from different developing countries, people from like Africa, the Caribbean, different parts of the, the African di diaspora, different other cultural traditions. And for me, it was just exciting to be in a diverse environment and to be surrounded by diversity. But I never forgot the value of an HBCU. Ironically for me, most of the colleges I applied to in college were HBCUs and I really wanted to go to Howard. And I was like, I wanna go to Howard. I got accepted to Howard. But my mom was like, you're too young because I graduated early. I graduated in the spring of 2012, but I was 17 at the time. My mom was like, when you turn 18, then you can go wherever you want, but kind of stay in the South, you know, while you're 17. And so I didn't go to Howard. And I wanted to do diplomacy at the time, be in, do international studies. And the only school in Louisiana that offered that as a major was UNO. But I always valued HBCUs. I grew up going to Southern Homecoming Games. I was on campus with my mom all the time. My mom went to Southern. My grandmother went to Southern. My great, great aunt, even though she didn't go to college, she always rooted for Southern. So the HBCU ex experience was a part of me. But I bring this up because even though I didn't go to graduate school in Louisiana, nor did I go to a HBCU, my New England school kind of was oriented towards doing an internship. Mm -hmm. And my internship phase could be anywhere in the world, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, wh wherever I wanted. I wanted to go back home. And I ended up going back home for my grad school career to do my internship with the micro project. And that is how I met you. So I want to know how you ended up working with Pico, 
which is what my, the micro project was connected to, as well as your experience working with Micah and how that intersected with your work at that time, because you were working in Catholic spaces as a Black Catholic, then working in the political space, and now you're in an interfaith organizing space. I feel like uh, everything happens for a reason, and every experience helps shape and, and mold you and prepares you for the next opportunity, right? So I did feel really much in my element when I was working with uh, the Micah Project because I it felt like that home good feeling, you know, being around people for the most part who, uh, who share the same values as you and just really centered some sense of spirituality, spiritual grounding, and, and being the purpose and reasoning to do, you know, social justice work, because I, I do feel like that is spiritual work in a way. And it's good work. And I got involved with them in my last year of grad school. Um, I saw an, an opportunity for a graduate assistantship with uh, Pico, Louisiana and Baton Rouge. And this was like in 2014. And I told them I wanted to do a uh, research project on the decriminalization of marijuana and how that was going to impact um, the state as far as revenue and also the, uh, the, the criminal justice system with mass incarceration. Because around that time, around 2014, 2013 is when we really started to see the uh, insurgence of the narrative shifting <clears throat> around mass incarceration in Louisiana. We started to see more attention, national attention even, and looking at uh, the incarceration rate per capita. And I remember being in these spaces uh, with, with different um, pastors and and priests and you know different faith leaders and they're all sitting there like you know the, the incarceration rate is too high you know we have the highest uh, incarceration rate in the world you know per capita and I'm like what you know and I, I'm just really um, in shock by this and these people were telling me you know uh, they they heard I was doing the research and everything around. Um, different laws uh, concerning uh, marijuana as far as criminalization of it, uh, the policy about stripping away, decriminalizing it, even to the point of legalization. And during my time of research, I studied policy that was for the purpose of my research project slash thesis. Um, I was essentially uh, and also getting paid as a graduate assistant. Like my research was also helping myself, but also helping uh, Pico, Louisiana at the time, with me sending them different policies that were passed in uh, Colorado, Washington State, Alaska, um, where they were able to utilize some of these points and in infusing and shaping some policy to push for decriminalization. Now, was this push successful? No, it was not. <laughs> I, I will say that my my document that came out, my published document, was was a benefit. You know, I was able to graduate and and have that strong experience and, and the networking that was done. But um, it was unfortunate to know that this was going to be that was my first experience of actually understanding what a journey meant for justice. I guess you can say because. We're trying this year and then they're like, okay, let's think three years out. And I'm sitting there like, wow, three years out. You know, this is all new to me because coming from political organizing, you, it's very transactional and it's for that short period of, of time. So, you know, um, to see people want to sit around and, and strategize and plan out three years out, I was pretty intrigued by that. To know like, this is an ongoing fight. We're not giving up, you know? And it's amazing to see how policy has shifted in Louisiana in regards to mass incarceration, uh, the criminal justice system, and marijuana laws to a degree as well, being six years out now, you know, because I've, I've, I've seen the paradigm shift where people were saying one thing and messaging, and now we're a bit, it's a bit tweaked, you know, and, and, and it shifted a bit. So I, I, I have seen some progress uh, thinking in retrospect to where we are now, but um, that was quite the experience and, um, and being connected to some of these people, again, it had definitely benefited when it was time to really step out on my own and really seek a job in my field of work after graduating with my master's and 
serving my time with the Democratic Party when they paid me as a campus organizer for about six months. <laughs> I was looking for the next opportunity and uh, lo and behold, I, uh, I helped do some work with a charter school in Baton Rouge before I left. And then I came on with the Michael Project in August, no, July, I'm sorry, July of 2015. And I moved to New Orleans in August. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> That was that was a pretty cool experience for the first year and a half. I was with the Michael Project, and I believe that's around the time where we met. And um, you were based in Baton Rouge, of course, and I really got involved with the public education system in New Orleans. And uh, at the time, I, I had a different opinion about school choice, but actually seeing how a mass privatization system has emerged in New Orleans and how they actually utilize the ideology of capitalism and neoliberalism and how that exploits black and brown communities in a very significant way. It really shifted my opinion about school choice then. And I seen it as a predatory uh, system. And because of that, it actually shifted the focus of the education campaign at MICA. And I think that's what led to um, myself getting laid off and a few other people where like we had like a complete, you know, dissolvement for a period of time at MICA uh, in 2016. And um, and I think about it, how uh, my executive director at the time, it was a big deal amongst other affiliates that were part of PICO when they heard that she turned down money from the Walton Foundation. And for myself at that time, I was like, wow, like, this is a leader that is convicted by her values. Like, you know, it, it means something to, to accept money from certain people who have different values from you. Cause that is, again, this is spiritual work. And my ED Rosie, God bless her. She, um, <laughs> she's a pastor as well, but she, again, you, Oh goodness. I'm, I'm losing words for this, but it's like, you have to, be meaningful in your in your how you perpetuate your behavior and how that aligns with your values and really having faith and i feel like that was a different type of morality that was required in organizing being in an interfaith space like it was just understood i understand everybody may not have good intentions showing up in spaces but they might put on a smile and talk a good talk but you know it's, it's up to you to have the the spirit of discernment to to be able to tell but um in that space, I appreciate the leaders I was around for that period of time who made uh, unpopular decisions, hard decisions, but stayed true to their values. I, I actually admire that. So though uh, it was unfortunate that, you know, I was laid off at Michael, but that was, that's what led me to start Step Up Louisiana. So, <laughs> yeah, everything happens for a reason. <laughs> I agree. I'm thinking about what you were saying and I'm, and I'm thinking about this saying that all money ain't good money. So just because a million dollars can come from different places, it can come from a good place. It can come from a place that may be a little bit questionable. So it's not always a bad thing to turn down money because everything comes to light. And you, within the worst thing that a nonprofit would want is to accept money and then later down the road be questioned about the money because some would say it conflicts with their value. What I often find is that you, your per perspectives on life, identity, social issues can change once your boots to the ground and you're actually witnessing with your eyes and hearing with your ears. Um, what have been some things that you have had a change in perspective on or a change in understanding once you've kind of transitioned into a different type of work, which is going from political organizing to community grassroots organizing? My views around privilege have really shifted. I even analyzed how I show up in, in the proximity of privilege, even within, uh, if we're looking at it from a vacuum, the black community in itself, you know, I think back on my upbringing, how my upbringing was a bit different even from my, my first cousins, like the children of my parents' siblings, you know, that close in relation. Um, having a, a day and night experience in a way. Also, looking at how my views about capitalism became a bit more sharpened, I guess you can say. Uh, 
and and I think that to um, just good wholesome grassroots community organizing <laughs> because you really see how the opposition is fueled by money and and, and fueled by pe- by people and and we got to really break down I really conceptualize what power is and what self-interest is and and what the power is behind building authentic real relationships. I've always seen myself as a people person, but I've really seen how my skill set had expanded working with um, the Micah Project as a community organizer, where I see myself having to wear different hats. Like one day I might be an educator, the next day I might be a counselor or a social worker. You know, it's, it's a multifaceted uh, role that actually, uh, it can take a lot out of you, honestly. And I actually gained to, came to understand what self-care was and how that was important and, and how we have to sustain ourselves in this work and what healing is, you know, and, and how uh, community work and social justice work can be healing to some people. I think back on uh, different past experiences I've had that were a bit challenging and how I came to face those as a, as a young adult, you know, somehow sometimes we may suppress some things, but then it comes back in the front of your head where you're faced with some posi- some situation that, that causes you to recollect a little bit, you know, and I just see that as just something coming full circle. I had a couple of full circle moments uh, being in New Orleans and, and working with the micro project, but I, I'm really grateful and blessed for the experience I've had that led me up to this point. It's great to be able to be in an environment where you're surrounded by people who mentor you. And as you said earlier, representation is important. So the mentors you have look like you and have your experiences. And it's also great to grow. I mean, thank God for growth. You know, being able to grow and evolve and be a better person than you were a month ago, a year ago, a decade ago, or even when you were you were a kid. I'm going to press forward a little bit, because I know you mentioned SEPA of Louisiana, and I know this is an organization that you're deeply involved in. And I want to know, you know, how SEPA of Louisiana started and the type of work that you've been able to do. And, you know, what does your work look like now with this, what we're dealing with with this pandemic? I still remember the date, you know, that uh, I was laid off from Micah, October 17th, 2016. Showing up and having no clue of what's about to happen. Now, I knew some things were, were falling off, you know, a little bit. I seen how my executive director was a bit more stressed out than normal. And I seen that she didn't have the support from the board, unfortunately, like she should have. Um, and I don't mind saying that it's, it's, it's really something that was truly witnessed on my with my own two eyes. But it, it was a lot of red flags but at the time I was a green organizer not thinking I'm just thinking of showing up and doing my work not thinking of the grander scheme of things but all of it was a big learning lesson and I remember having the conversation with her and she said you know I'm I'm sorry to say this and she broke down in tears saying I'm going to resign but I really want you to pray before going into this next meeting and I took some time to pray and then I and it dawned on me that uh if Rosie's leaving, are we leaving too? Or is somebody else coming in? Like, what is going to become of us? Because there was so much uncertainty uh, amongst the other board members. And sure enough, they had myself, Mark, and Dr. Lou on the phone. And uh, me and Mark were at the office. And uh, they, they pretty much said, yeah, this is, a, this is a layoff. You know, I'm like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? You know? And sure enough, two weeks later, already I'm thinking of shifting my career path and I'm thinking of becoming an educator and studying to take the praxis and looking up different uh, alternative teaching programs because I said, I'm like, if I'm not going to be organizing right now, I'm going to be in somebody's classroom teaching kids. Like, (laughs) that was just where I was at. I didn't mind shifting my career in a way of being a social studies teacher or something, you know, and, and still doing some aspect of education justice work because I built so many different relationships with people across the country. I traveled so much working with Micah where I met people from different backgrounds and nationalities and it actually helped me to open my mind up a bit more that, hey, not all white people are bad, you know? <laughs> It's the truth. That's my experience. So I, I, I have to be honest about that. And I, <laughs> I, I was really 
sitting with this uh, dumbfounded feeling like I have all these resources in my lap right now and I refuse to sit on my hands because children in New Orleans are suffering. Like at that moment, that's how I genuinely felt. And I'm like, I really want to at least try to do some work to start my own thing or what. I don't know. And I prayed on it. And two weeks later, my colleague Ben Zucker called me and he told me, Maria, what are you doing? And I'm like, man, I'm looking for another job. I just got laid off. He was like, what? You know, and he's telling me how his contract is about to end soon with the Fight for 15 campaign. And he was like, let's meet, let's get together, let's talk. So we, we started meeting in uh, November 2016. I can't remember the date we met, but we met at Monkey Monkey on Carrollton in, in New Orleans. And when I sat down with him, I told him there were three things that I feel uh, I I'm going to commit my time to. And I said, that's racial justice, education justice, and the environment. I said, these are the three things that have an impact on my life, have an impact on my loved ones and my family. I said, that's, that's what I feel convicted to fighting for. And he was like, awesome. And he told me about labor organizing and his experience with that and um, how he's seen that has helped disenfranchised communities uh, for a period of time. Because he's a young white guy himself uh, from from Maryland and um, and really is a strong ally, you know, to disenfranchised communities, communities of color, black people, you know, but um, he, uh, I, hearing his experience helped me to remember this experience my dad went through with doing labor organizing in Lake Charles where he worked at a plant and he went on strike for six months, my freshman year in college. And I remember just his convicted values at that moment you know, and how he knew he was out the door, but with this new company coming in to buy out where their current employer, there were different stipulations and uh, hiring practices and um, job benefits packages and pay that were going to be much different than what he had. He was already grandfathered in where he was going to be putting in his retirement. None of that was going to shift for him, but what he felt bad about was the men coming in after him. Like he worked at a plant. He was like, it makes no sense to not have health insurance. Like how the hell do you not have health insurance you work at a plant? I'm like, true, you know? And he was telling me about the pay. He said, it's just a disgrace. He said, those guys coming in, they don't deserve that. They working hard just like I did. So he, when he retired, he not only retired with his dignity, but he also retired with his conscience. And him making a stand and, and striking, that was pretty hard on my family where for six months, they only had one income, my mom's income. And of course, my dad had a little check coming in from him being a retired military uh, person. But, you know, uh, his income from the plant definitely helped with a lot of other things. So I've I seen them actually make choices and sacrifices during that time. And, and because of that, they actually had a powerful impact where they, were, they weren't able to get all what they wanted, but neither did the company they bought their current employer out. It was a strong method of a negotiation for a period of time where at the end of the day, the guys coming in after my dad, they had some sense of being paid dignity and respect on the job. And I knew from that experience alone, the work that Ben was doing was very powerful. And I knew that he and I developing an organizing project together centering around economic justice and education, but also being a racial justice organization, I knew we were going to build out something pretty powerful. So, <laughs> you know, Stuff Up Louisiana came to be in 2017. Ben already had a few good relationships with folks who could help us get started, which I really claim it all as a blessing. Um, the Center for Popular Democracy uh, listened to us uh, later on in like late November 2016, early December. And uh, they told us to draft out a five page project proposal, which is what we did. And at first we were calling ourselves Step Up New Orleans. So they spelled out the acronym SUN. <laughs> so that's why we have like the SUN logo. And I feel like at that moment, you know, it's a new day, you know, even though we just got 45 elected, we can still fight for change and, and change always brings in a new day. And I really see that as a, a new day as being something positive. So that's all like, let's stick with the sun logo and been like that idea. And then when we told the folks that we plan on going statewide later on in 2019, they were like, hold on, if you're going to be statewide, just go ahead and name yourselves that step up Louisiana. And I'm like, okay, you know, I said, but we're keeping the sun logo. <laughs> 
So we kept that. And I really feel like that was a, a unique twist to our, our branding, you know, and um, I feel like that works for us. And, you know, if we have some changes that come along the way, you know, come with me. But I, I'm really proud of what we built so far. We've done some very meaningful work. I've if somebody would have told me I would be here now, like five years ago, like literally just moving to New Orleans five years ago, I would probably not believe them. Like, hey, you're going to work for this nonprofit for a year and a half. And then guess what? You're going to start your own thing with this other guy. And y'all going to be covering two major cities in the state. Like, <laughs> who would have known? Or, you know, I, I feel like our biggest milestone was, well, first off was the Poor People's Campaign in 2018, where I actually like went to jail for doing this work. And these people literally held us unlawfully. Like, I really feel like there were some policies broken there and how they handled us for blocking the street. But it was a big learning lesson in that respect. And I feel like that experience helped to shape me as an, as an activist and also as an organizer. The other experience was us and our, our level of impact during the 2019 GOTV season. We knocked on over 46,000 doors. Um, between New Orleans and Baton Rouge with over 25 canvassers, um, 10 to 15 each in New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And as a new baby organization, you know, two years in at that time, you know, we're going on, we, we just made three years, but last year, the impact we made, I am so proud. <laughs> and, and that's just a reflection of just Ben and I's leadership, but also the leadership of the people that we trust to lead the work, like our organizers. So I'm so grateful for everybody, like our members, you know, our leaders that have come along the way, our partners like yourself. I feel like everybody contributes to this, you know, and I, I, I'm just so humbled. Like, I, this is bigger than myself, you know, and um, I'm just trying to do my part, you know. But <laughs> And I see the results because I've to my knowledge, I know that, you know, Step Up Louisiana works all over the state, but I know that because Baton Rouge and New Orleans are like down the street, I assume a lot of work is in Baton Rouge and New Orleans a lot of the time. And right. I know for a fact that if you looked at the governor results, a lot of people came out, you know, came out to vote. That canvassing paid off. On the flip side, you know, Step Up Louisiana has had some challenges as well with doing a lot of different things. Um, what have been some challenges that you have, you know, experienced doing this work with Step Up Louisiana and, you know, maybe some setbacks that you may have experienced if it applies? What Ben and I built together was definitely a multiracial, multicultural organization. And we're also intergenerational. So we have people from different ethnicities and economic backgrounds, socioeconomic statuses and in different ages. So because of that much diversity, there are different schools of thought in one room. <laughs> and uh, we, we've we had uh, different disagreements on things. There were times where some members had some blind spots to other people's disenfranchisement, I guess you could say, just not really fully aware of their own privilege, you know. And it was my past experiences that helped to shape and mold my view and approaching my leadership in that respect of of, of really laying claim to creating a safe space for everyone to be heard. And, and we don't want this to have this tone of like all lives matter because that, that's definitely not what it is, but you can definitely be in multi-racial and cultural spaces where that actually is a thing. And one thing for sure is we don't want Step Up Louisiana to be that, we know that. <laughs> and, and I'm the one, I don't mind calling people in or out whenever it's necessary. If I see you exhibiting harm and you're intentional about it, I'm, I'm definitely going to call it out right there. But if I see some folks who are just, Jesus didn't know any better. And I understand people have different growth to levels of growth to get to where they need to be. Um, there's a way of reaching folks. You know, um, there are times where it kind of made me a bit uncomfortable because I'm thinking to myself, why do I have this emotional labor on me? This is not fair. <laughs> But at the same time, I did sign up to start this organization and there's a lot on me as a leader in that respect as a co-founder and co-director. So um, sometimes I have to bite the bullet and, and, and just face the challenge head on, you know? I can't lie, this is stressful. It's not a, a cakewalk every day. Um, <laughs> but learning to trust people, building relationships with people, um, 
just coming from an honest place. And I've really seen lately, I've, I've been more on this kick of, of just being a humanist, you know, um, seeing people first as being human. Um, and, and that really helped me in be, having a white male partner, organizing partner like Ben has helped me to think more from a humanist framework. Um, Cause I'm like, hey, okay, your feelings might be hurt, but your feelings are kind of prohibiting someone from actually expressing where the harm was done. We might have to retract a little bit and maybe put our fragility to the side. You know, it's, hey, it's, it's, it's some uncomfortable conversations being made. So how can we really be a racial justice organization? It is multicultural, but you know, we're actually posturing ourselves politically in this way, but also how are we perpetuating that, that you know, that uh, sentiment uh, internally, you know, and I feel like all that is part of our different pathways to leadership development. There's going to be a different pathway for white people. There's going to be a different pathway for black, indigenous, and people of color. We know we have to create spaces for healing as well. So as Step Up continues to grow and, and carry on different facets and really have a strong hold on what me membership is, I really feel like that was a, another milestone for us coming um, into this third year and building out a strategic plan over the next three years for ourselves, I seen that we have really done a great job in defining membership for ourselves. Cause at first it was a bit of a challenge. We're like, we're new. We're just trying to get out here to do this work, but we're, we want members. And now we're like, okay, we have members and this is what membership is. So I, I really think that's really dope right now with where we're at. It always takes a while to hustle and get your name out there and to build something. Because I know when the A2 and Project started, you know, the A2 and Project of 2020 is light years away from the A2 and Project of 2016, which in many ways comes from sacrifice. It comes from failing. It comes from succeeding. It comes from having those moments where you feel like, man, is what I'm doing even worth it? So the moments where you get awards and people are, you know, shouting you out in the news and you are able to get like a lot of of clout and it's it's a progress it's a journey and another thing that i thought about is that step up new orleans is sun step up louisiana not necessarily so but you could say soul and you need soul to do the work that you do i love you it. need a lot of, you need a, you need a lot of soul to do the work that you do so the acronym still works and if you're going to be scientific with photosynthesis you need the sun to grow and to get your energy so there's so many metaphors look i'm a i i do poetry so the metaphors i, I can it. just keep going <laughs> but and in all seriousness though i have two last questions to ask you you've come a long way you did organizing as a young person as a teenager at southern and grad school with pico now you're doing it with several louisiana we are in the midst of a pandemic so in many ways it's very difficult to envision the future because right now this pandemic has completely erased our sense of the future, but it always is fun to dream. What are some things that you would like to accomplish personally speaking, as well as with Step Up Louisiana? Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm really proud of the parent leadership development work I've been able to take part in over the past three years and I'm starting to get phone calls from other parents in other parts of the state. There's, a, there's starting to be a growing demand in my hometown area where I have parents from Lake Charles, Lafayette, and uh, Allen Parish who are just like, hey, we see the work y'all are doing. Can, can we get a meeting or some type of chapter set up for our parents out here? We want a parent union. And I'm like, oh my God, like a parent union thing is like, it's really a thing. When people hear it, they're like, oh, y'all out here doing something. We know some of the stuff y'all done doing, you know, and it, it, that feels good. And um, I, I, it feels really good to know that parents uh, feel empowered when we're in the room with them and to actually see a black mama in New Orleans stand in her power and tell a school board member, you gonna listen to me today because she knew everybody in the room had her back. That's what this is about, you know, I, oh, I'm grateful. <laughs> and and it, it's those little victories that, that really fuel us for the big one, you know, and the big one, it ain't going to come today or tomorrow, but it's coming, you know, and 
I feel like uh, th this work that we're doing is so meaningful. It really is. And, and it's helping to, uh, to shift a bigger uh, change systemically that's going to impact so many ch different children that haven't even touched the public school system yet in, the, in Louisiana. And um, I, I'm really excited to see that. And personally, I want to see more organized, safe organizing spaces um, that centers uh, Black leadership and Black organizing, because I can't lie, even in, in multicultural spaces in some ways, if, especially if it's in a white dominant culture, I'll say that. <laughs> it, it, can, uh, it can deter some people that really have the potential to really be reached in a, in a meaningful way. And I'm thinking, okay, how can I adapt myself in that respect then? I remember you also mentioned the COVID-19 uh, response. Um, that has been definitely challenging for us, but we have shifted in, in so many ways. And by challenging, I mean the demand is high. Uh, I found, even though I'm working from home, I find myself working more, you know, um, days packed with Zoom meetings back to back. But that's just the need that has to be met right now. And um, we're trucking along with, uh, we're doing some meaningful work, like we're, our parent union in Baton Rouge is still heavily engaged with keeping the school board accountable and, and staying engaged with the superintendent search. Like from the very beginning all the way up to this point, we've had meaningful involvement with it. In New Orleans, we're really on a touch, touch a strong touch and go basis with parents one-on-one -on -one out there. And we're preparing for a pretty big town hall to really analyze, are we ready to go back to school? Um, we, we put up a big fight with House Bill 59 that was in the state legislature that was going to give just about every school system, public, private, parochial, um, charter, immunity from being held liable for if people return back and they contract COVID-19 or if they die from it, they cannot sue. They wouldn't be, they would be, they would have immunity. So even though this bill passed through a, diff a lot of different channels in the legislature, went through the House committee, the House floor, the Senate committee and the Senate floor, but we put a lot of pressure on uh, elected senators in the legislature to put amendments in that, in that bill to uh, soften the blow that it could take on teachers and students and families because this pandemic is serious, but it's just crazy to see the different policies they're trying to put in place that is really impacting our lives, like literally trying to put profits over people. And it's, it's really crazy to see it happen, but uh, we have to keep fighting that. So that, that's been our big challenge right now. It's always a journey, and it's one that has a lot of highs and a lot of lows and a lot of challenges. Yes. And when you're doing this work in Louisiana, it's very difficult, but it's possible. Just because something is difficult doesn't mean it's impossible. It's, and it can't be done. It just means that you'll need a lot more wind beneath your wings yes. to get some movement and some momentum. I always love doing these interviews because I get to meet people. Sometimes I get to know more about the people that I know. And I think I've learned so much more about you because I've known you personally. But getting to know your background has been something that's been deeply humbling and empowering for me. But I also know that when you're being interviewed and you got to answer different questions, you may have some thoughts, some things you want to express that you may not be able to get off your chest. You may feel awkward if you have to leave the interview and hold that in. So I want to give you a chance to share some final thoughts with me. You know, what is something that you want to express that you haven't had a chance to express during the course of this interview? I really appreciate this time talking with you and I feel like this interview was somewhat therapeutic, you know, and I appreciate that. <laughs> but I just want people to know like you, everybody has something to contribute on this earth, you know, and actually tapping into what your passion is and, and actually being intentional about uh, seeking your purpose and doing good uh, for others and, 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 and no harm, you know, just living in that framework. I think the first act of, of radicalization is, is a, a transformation in yourself. And um, that's something I've really been committed to um, in just doing this type of work. And um, I try to influence others to, to think in that aspect as well, because this work is so healing. It really can be if you let it. And everyone, again, has something powerful contri to contribute. We were all here for a reason. 
Maria, thank you so much for sharing your story, being unvarnished, being un authentic. And I wish you all the best with the work that you're doing with Step Up Louisiana in spite of this, you know, pandemic. We do have a lot going on at, in the latter half of 2020. So I hope that you all are ready. We have local elections, state elections. You have a national election. We have to figure out how to manage the pandemic once it kind of simmers down and okay. how we're going to make sure that vulnerable people are not left out on the streets, metaphorically and literally. And also, you know, once the pandemic has turns a corner and we're back to some semblance of normalcy, if we will even be there, then I'm sure the work that you were working on before the pandemic will be back on your plate. So yes. sending you all the love, sending you all the encouragement and all the support and solidarity. Oh, thank you, Jahi. And I see you and appreciate the work you're doing, honey. And just keep doing it. I love it. I love thank seeing you. it. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Alrighty. Take care. Thank you too.